The mark of Cain is stamped upon our foreheads. Across the centuries our brother Abel has lain in blood which we drew, and shed tears we caused by forgetting thy love. Unquote. That was a prayer from Pope John the twenty third in nineteen sixty, as cited in Vicars of Christ, Dark Side of the Papacy. And this is the introduction to chapter 24 of Rulers of Evil. Useful knowledge about governing bodies. The Mark of Cain. We are coming slowly, but we are coming to a conclusion of the book. After this, there is only one chapter left. I've dedicated a lot of time in reading the book and making videos out of them. And I hope they will be received very well. First and for all, I hope that they will be spread. Because this book gives us kind of a knowledge that is very interesting for a lot of people to know who are, up to now probably, more ignorant than they have been before reading the book. The Mark of Cain is one of the most important chapters of the book. I can tell you. Even though that in the beginning of the book, in the introduction, it is said you can read this book chapter by chapter, or you can pick a chapter here and pick a chapter there, you don't have to read it front to cover. I agree, you don't have to read it front to cover, but if you do as I do here with the official reading, then you see how it all builds up to a climax because all the knowledge that you've been given from chapter 2 up to 24 actually culminates in chapter 1 that you could read at the end of the book for better understanding. Starting this chapter with the prayer of the Antichrist, Pope John the 23rd gives you a glance of that in this prayer there is truth in it and that there is a grain of truth under a mountain of every lie is something we will discover when we go into this chapter. When you want to get more information about the mark of Cain I can advise you to look up Walter Feit's video The Mark of Cain or the Herodian mind. Both videos they deal with the same stuff. And I can very much advise you to watch these. But Tapasosi wrote this as the last but one chapter in his book Rulers of Evil because he wants to make a point. And the point is that he states we live in the new world order, just as people under Augustus Caesar did. Not a future thing to be feared or avoided. The new world order is a present reality to be identified, understood and dealt with in a way most pleasing to God. It was God, after all, who established the new world order. We can read about it in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is the only record we have that publicly and truthfully sets forth the essentials to the order's origin and development through time. Now, the Bible records the great decisive events in the progress of human life up to the close of the first century AD. Creation of earth and the fullness thereof, creation of man and woman, their turning away from God, the first conception, the first birth, the first sacrifice, the first murder, the first insignia, the first city, the first and only great flood, the surviving family and its peculiar relationship through time with God. All of this momentous data is given in the Bible with a stark truthfulness that is invariably supported open, uh, often to the surprise of many by the results of the scientific inquiry. 
the writers of the Bible, Israelite prophets inspired by their God, held no monopoly on reporting these events. Priests of other nations reported them too, but in doing so, they cunningly adapted them to, it, to fit prevailing administrative needs. The result of their adaptions is what we call mythology. Yeah. Missionary adaption reminds you also a little bit of this, I think. No? It's absolutely the case that there are writers outside of the Bible who used what was written in the Bible to their advantage. That is, in other words, what Tapper Saucy tells us here right now. One very persistent myth based on a crucial event accounted for in the Bible explained to people under Babylonian rulership the divine origin of their government. This was the myth of Marduk. The myth of Marduk begins with Anu, quote, the head deity of Babylonian mythology, unquote, looking down upon earth in dismay. The land is in chaos, overrun by floodwaters and monstrous serpents. Anu senses that bringing order to such chaos is a job for Marduk, the firstborn son of the moon goddess Ea. So Anu summons Marduk and asks him to organize the earth. Marduk agrees to the task, but, quote, only on the condition that he be f made first among the gods and that his word shall have the force of the decree of Anu, unquote. Now, Anu accepts Marduk's terms and vests him with, quote, the powers and insignia of kingship. And Marduk's word was declared to have the authority of Anu, unquote. Armed with divine power, Marduk goes to the earth and separates dry land from sea. He polices the monsters, and any evildoer foolish enough to oppose him receives the wrath of God. The result of Marduk's ordination was depicted in the steel of Naram Sin, now in the Louvre. This very ancient Babylonian monument that you see in the picture and the video right here now, Anu is shown imbuing Naram Sin, Enoch, to the Hebrews, with power over a mass of other, other beings. Anu's name, seen in the tip of the steel, is the cuneiform symbol for heaven, or the double cross, or the picture you will see here, the sign of Anu. Marduk wears the Anu signature like a cup with his badge. It makes him a god. In fact, the ordination of power iconography of ancient Babylonian nations was never without it, even today. And that you can see in the annex that I'm just going through with you right now. So I'm putting here the pictures of the annex. This is uh, Appendix A of the Book of Rulers of Evil. And we analyze a few pictures that we see here. So the first that you see here on your left side of the screen is the hem of Marduk's garment, as you probably um, will see in the video later when I put that in there, consists of the Anu signature, authorizing Marduk to rule evildoers. And on the right we see the next picture. This is ancient Babylonian cylinder, and the British Museum depicts the Queen of Heaven, Ishtar, empowered uh, by four Anu signatures that you can see in the picture when you have a good look. One, two, three, four. Yeah. And on the left side, uh, now the lowest picture in the video here, a stone tablet in the British Museum depicts Nabonidas, the scholarly Lab uh, Babylonian Pontifex Maximus, supervising the placement of the ancient Anu signature during the restoration of Anu's temple at Separa, eight or ninth centuries before Christ. And you see uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, the big one, of course. <laughs> then it's seven of the Anus signature in there. Now, on the next page, we see on the right hand side, from us, from our perspective, St. Peter's Piazza at Rome, where thongs gather to give audience 
to the popes is inlaid with the Anu signature, or you can also call it the Sun Wheel, it's also called. And below we see the front and the back side of an ancient Assyrian Babylonian bronze tablet representing the world in the clutches of an evil demon, as stated in the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 7, page 190, in the 1959 edition. The demon is just the dog who shepherds unruliness for Anu, as does Satan for Yahweh, quote, by going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Unquote. Note the Anu signature just below and to the left of the dog's gapping mouth. Canines are a favorite metaphor for Cain. There is no brighter star in the heavens than the quote unquote, dog star, named Canis Major after Cain. The Egyptians called Canis the second sun because it ruled the mysterious world of night a ruler of what Paul calls, quote, the darkness of this world, in Ephesians 6, verse 12. Homer called Canis the evil star, because its rising brought on the hot summer season and, it attendant, and its attendant pestilence. Human sacrifices were offered to appease the dark star, believed by many scholars to be the Lucifer of Isaiah 14, verse 12. You probably remember Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? In the following verses we see how the Bible explains the pentagram with the five rebellious eyes of Lucifer when he rebelled in heaven. So on the bottom of the picture here you see on the right the Anu signature declares the entrance to Harvard Law School. And when we come to the next picture we see a Masonic temple as the commander Albert Pike attested the Anu signature and other emblems representing Cain's authority to rule have been protected by Freemasonry since their creation by Enoch. Every Masonic temple proclaims its devotion to Anu and we will read more of that when we go back to the book. Now, for the pictures below, you have to see that this is the Supreme Court building that reveals the Anu signature in its exterior stone and bronze work, as well as its interior throughout. American justices avenges its offenders at least sevenfold, not because it is corrupt, but because it has inherited Cain's divine empowerment to do so. And this was a little excursion into the appendix of the Book of Rulers of Evil. I will now continue reading on the bottom of page 267, for if you want to follow along. Like he says, even today, as we can see in the appendix, we find it in the flag of Great Britain. I'm going to put that one here in the video right now. Which is said to be the union of St. Andrew's Scottish Cross and St. George's English Cross, which I find a prime example of esoteric and exoteric knowledge. What you are told is the knowledge of the masses, not for the initiated. You are told this is a union of St. Andrew's Scottish Cross and St. George's English Cross, and they know that it is the mark of Anu something completely different. We find it prominently displayed in the decor of government buildings, especially courtrooms. It forms the motive for much of the decorative architecture of the US Supreme Court building, as we just see in the saw in the annex. Interior and exterior. The pavement surrounding the obelisk of Caligula in St. Peter's Piazza where the multitude stand to receive papal edicts and blessings, is inlaid with a gigantic Anu signature. No doubt about it, a very ancient symbol has remained consistently identified with the presence of rulership. Could it be that a symbol of so much power is based on a myth? Or is it based on the fact from which the myth sprang? This, dear listener, is the grain of truth that is the basis of all the lies. 
all lie has to be built on the truth. Because if the lie doesn't know the truth, it cannot be a lie. You can only turn the truth around when you know the truth. Think about that. The grain of truth that is the basis of all lies. The author continues, the sensitive Bible reader immediately sees in the myth of Marduk a missionary adaption of the biblical account of Cain. The true prota protagonists are remarkably similar. Both Cain and Marduk were firstborn sons of mothers bearing almost the same name. Marduk, son of Ea, Cain, son of Eve. Both firstborns were appointed to rule over evil albeit in different reasons. Marduk because of his heroism, Cain because of his wickedness. So that they might move effectively among evildoers, both were given protective seals to, of immunity by the God of heaven. God said to Cain, Therefore, whosoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. As we can read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 15. In Marduk's case, the evildoers were chaotic beings ruining Anu's earth. Cain's evildoers were persons who might slay him because he had become a homeless trespasser. The Bible details exactly why Cain became homeless. His farm refused to yield harvests because he had defiled the soil with the blood of his brother. Cain, quote, rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him, unquote. We are not told why. It may have been a jealous rage. It may have not. Nothing in scripture indicates that Cain hated Abel. The most we know of their relationship is that Cain, quote, talked with his brother, unquote, and afterward, in a field, murdered him. As we can read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, quote, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Unquote. Nor are we given details of the murder, except that it was bloody. The blood is an important clue as to motive. We know that Cain was first crestfallen, then angry at God for prefer preferring Abel's sacrifice to his own, as we can check in Genesis 4 verse 5. But unto Cain, the quote goes from the Bible, and to his offerings he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Unquote. Now Abel, the shepherd, sacrificed lambs from his flock, as we can read in Genesis 4 verse 2. Quote, and she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Unquote. Cain, the farmer, apparently thinking sacrifice was about returning the best of his productivity to God, sacrificed the best of his harvest. God found Cain's sacrifice offensive and Abel's pleasing, as we can read in Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5. Quote, and in process of time it came to pass that Cain <coughs> sorry that Cain brought uh, of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Unquote. Now elsewhere in scripture we learn why. It involves a principle that is very difficult for many of us to comprehend. The principle is, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, as we can read in Hebrews 9.22. And let me also tell you my opinion of this, because in my opinion there is also another reason. Cain brought the fruits of his work, and that's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church teaches also. Salvation through works. As you have in the Roman Catholic Church, for example, the sacraments. 
those are getting you saved. Not that you believe in Jesus Christ, not that you accept him as your Savior, not that you know that he died for you and uh, resurrected three days after, and that you accept that, and that you believe in him, and that you follow his commandments. No, those things won't save you according to the Roman Catholic Church, but works will do. And that's what Cain did. He offered the, uh, the, the results of his works to God. Not a blood sacrifice. The great teaching of the Bible is that the death sentence mankind has inherited from the original breaking of God's law by Cain's parents. Quote, Thou shalt not eat of the fruit. Unquote is pardonable only by death, by the extreme act of shedding blood fatally. This teaching is the bedrock of the Old Testament and the whole point of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the people of God were pardoned the sinfulness inherited from Adam by shedding the blood of animals as Abel had dutifully done. In the New Testament, the people of God were pardoned this same sinfulness by doing exactly as Cain had done, shedding the blood of a man. To this day, according to the scriptures, all who believe that Jesus Christ's blood has power to remit sins are imputed sinless by God. If we go for Reformation or to numerous places in the Bible, what I've just read. According to the scriptures, all who believe that Jesus Christ's blood has power to remit sins, imputed sinless by God. You can read that for yourselves. Matthew 26, verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28. Romans 3, verse 25. And Romans 5, verse 9. Ephesians 1, verse 7. And Ephesians 2, verse 13. Colossians 1, verse 13, 14. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12, verse 20, chapter 10 verse 19, chapter 13 verse 12, 1 Peter 1 verse 2 and 19, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, and Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, chapter 7 verse 14, and chapter 12 verse 11. Numerous places in the Bible that you know that all who believe in Jesus Christ's blood has the power to remit sins are imputed sinless by God. Imputed sinless. Their sentence of eternal separation from God is commuted and they are given eternal life in heaven. As we can read in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. Quote, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Unquote. Now, Scripture does not tell us that God ever explained the purpose of blood sacrifice to Cain. We can read, therefore, Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Unquote. But we know that God is the greatest of all teachers, and we know he wants the best for mankind. It's unthinkable, then, that he would, uh, that he would want Cain ignorant of the life-saving effect of blood sacrifice. He must have taught Cain as thoroughly as he taught Abel. And Cain must have listened attentively, for we know he was anxious to please God. Otherwise, why would we have an why would he have been angry and crestfallen at learning of God's dissatisfaction with his sacrifice? But Cain was more creative than obedient. Oh, it's entirely consistent with his character for him to have decided, okay, if it's blood sacrifice he wants, I'll give him the sacrifice he deserves, a better sacrifice than lambs. I'll give him the blood of an innocent man. Cain's intent was evil only in that he sought to improve on what God had commanded in the way Saul improved on God's commandment to annihilate the Amalekites by sparing their king and certain valuable livestock. 
Therefore, we can go to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 9. Quote, But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refused, that they had destroyed utterly. Unquote. Cain knew the logic of God. He was, after all, the first human being born with knowledge of good and evil. And we know from what happened to Jesus that God's logic calls for the sacrifice of the only one whose perfect innocence overcame death. In his obsession to please God, wouldn't Cain have regarded spilling Abel's blood as the ultimate godliness? What I am suggesting is that in Cain's mind, Abel was not so much murdered as he was sacrificed, nailed to Anu's very name, the cross, hanged upon a cross. Wouldn't this explain why scripture shows no evidence that Cain sensed any guilt? Wouldn't it also explain the hundreds of ancient pre-Christian myths of young shepherds such as Tammuz, Bacchus, Attis, and Mithras? who were slain in cold blood by various villains only to rise from the dead, their shed blood having supposedly propitiated original sin and resurrected them to eternal life? The myths, obviously based on the fact of Abel's crucifixion, all pointed to a universally anticipated event foretold by the Israelite prophets. Messiah's death and resurrection, which would pardon the sins of mankind and restore eternal life. Thus emerges the possibility that quote, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world unquote, mentioned in Revelation 13 verse 8 might have indeed been Abel, God's first obedient servant. For it is a fact that quote, the world unquote, by which the New Testament writers meant the ordering of human institutional systems which God admitted to existence did actually begin, as we were about to see, in the immediate aftermath of Abel's death. If this is the case, then mankind owes a strange debt to Cain. No Cain, no death of Abel. No death of Abel, no world. No world, no incarnation of God as only begotten Son. No Son of God, no true death and resurrection. No true death and resurrection, no hope of mankind for eternal intimacy with God. It was the complaint of an earth outraged by Abel's spilt blood that moved God to banish Cain from his accustomed habitat forever. Just as Marduk demanded protection from the monsters he had been asked to control, Cain demanded protection from possible asylums in his exile. God graciously accommodated Cain by setting a mark upon him which made Cain seven times more powerful than any mortal competitor. The mark served as the very powers and insignia of kingship Anu had granted Marduk. It empowered Cain to rule all human beings like, uh, likely to challenge his protective mark beings unafraid of Yahweh's name, as we can read in Genesis 4, verse 26. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call, up, uh, call upon the name of the Lord. Only upon the birth of Seth's son Enos did men begin to call the name of the Lord. Up to that time most of humanity apparently ignored or denied the holy name. These were Cain's lawful subjects. So beings unafraid of Yahweh's name, beings who shared Cain's environs, quote, out from the presence of the Lord, unquote. Armed with his mark, Cain began the rulership of evil goes right back to the Antichrist in the beginning of the chapter. Huh? Cain began the rulership of evil. The Bible accounts for Cain's movements after his ordination. He took a wife and sired a son. 
Then he built a city and named it after his son Enoch. Centuries later, Enoch disappeared under the silt of Noah's flood. It passed from memory to mystery to oblivion until the 1840s, when archaeologists following the Bible's descriptions of Babylonia began excavating in present-day Iraq. Along the Euphrates River, near al Kidr, they discovered numerous strata of ancient settlements. The deepest stratum, beneath which there was nothing but bedrock, had called itself Unuk. Unuk was founded on the oldest bricks, declared one of the leading archaeologists, a renowned classical linguist from Queen's College, Oxford, named Archibald Sacy. Having deciphered and re-evaluated large number of clay tablets from the site, Professor Sacy is, uh, issued the opinion in 1887 that Unuk was indeed Biblical Enoch, the city built by Cain and his son. Lecturing at Oxford, Sicy also pointed out that one of the Cain's mythological names was Marduk. But Sais used the term Merodach, which is the Hebrew variant of Marduk. An important contribution to the Marduk equals Cain hypothesis. Unuk's dominant temple bore the title, quote, House of Anu, unquote further enhancing the probability that Marduk's miss was spun from Cain's murder of Abel. As ruler of Unuk, Cain was known as Sargon, or, as other translators have rendered the spelling, Shargani, Serukinu, Sargoni, etc. These variations of Sargon are composites of the Babylonian Shar, meaning king, and Gani, Kinu, or Goni, meaning Cain. It would be hard to say Sargon means anything other than King Cain. Unuk had been no primitive village. Encyclopedia Britannica noted that, quote, transparent glass seems to have been the first introduced in the reign of Sargon, unquote. Sargon built a metropolis of enormous complexity. But what astonished the archaeologist most was the city's miraculous historical suddenness. Unuk seemed to have materialized from out of nowhere. We have found, in short, abundant remains of a bronze culture, but no traces of preceding ages of development such as meet us on early Egyptian sites. The suddenness factor severely challenged those scholars who viewed history through Darwinian anti-biblicalism, which had become the fashion in Jesuit-influenced academic circles. You really want me to make a comment here? When you have serious scientists, you will always prove that the Bible is true and evolution is wrong. I won't go any further than this right here. To fit evolutionary theory, Unuk should have uh, evidenced development from a much older civilization. As a contributor to the London Times prestigious historian's history of the world grumbled, quote, Surely such a people as this could not have sprung into existence as Deus ex machina, meaning a person or thing introduced or appearing unexpectedly, so as to provide an artificial or contrived solution to an otherwise insoluble problem. It must have had its history, a history which presupposes development of several centuries more. Yeah. If only evolutionary theory would be right. But it is not, and that's why you don't find any predecessor. But Unuk as a social organization had no previous history. This maddening circumstance drove the British Museum H.R. Hall to rationalize that its quote-unquote ready-made culture must have been quote, brought into Mesopotamia from abroad, unquote. Modern anti-biblicists find it easier to accept that Unuk's sudden complexity came from other galaxies than from something as simple as 
acquiring divine intelligence from biting into a piece of forbidden fruit. Of course, eating the fruit of a disobedience is how the Bible explains the suddenness factor. Cain had extraordinary powers because he inherited from his parents the knowledge of good and evil, which the trickster had encouraged them to obtain at the price of eternal life. Yea, hath God said? In Mrs. Bristow's words, quote, Cain was born and bred in the atmosphere of the miraculous. His parents were possessed of supernatural knowledge, some of which must have been imparted to their children. Unquote. King Cain was no primitive chieftain. On one of his many autobiographical inscriptions he boasted that quote, in multitudes of bronze chariots I rode over rugged lands, I governed the upper countries, unquote, and quote, three times to the sea I have advanced. Unquote. A brilliant, well-organized military emperor, the prototypical Caesar, Cain controlled a vast empire. The Cambridge history tells us he divided his imperium, quote, from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean, from the rising of the setting of the sun to the setting of the sun into districts of five double hours march each, over which he placed the sons of his palace. By these delegates of his authority he ruled the hosts of the lands together. Unquote. Cain's empire was founded on slavery, the inevitable result of one man's retributive power exceeding all others sevenfold. For the most part, however, it appears that Cain exercised his advantage in the public interest. Professor Sacy tells us that his empire was, quote, full of schools and libraries, of teachers and pupils and poets and prose writers, and of the literary works which they had composed, unquote. And in my, York's opinion, it is, I think, safe to say that this is the early learning against learning, the source of Gnosticism from satanic influence. Furthermore, the author continues, quote, The empire was bound together by roads, along which there was a regular postal service, and clay seals which took the place of stamps are now in the Louvre, that's the uh, museum in Paris, bearing, this, bearing the name of Sargon and his son. It is probable that the first collection of astronomical observations and terrestrial omens was made for a library established by Sargon. Unquote. The insignia of power and kinship and kingship did not vanish with Cain's death. That Cain built the original city with the sun implies that the mark was intended to be a hereditary entitlement. The sun's name implies that he received the power of the mark from his father. Enoch in Hebrew means the initiated, to be inducted by special rites, to be instructed in the rudiments or principles of something. Scripture implies that Enoch and perhaps Cain in turn initiated other deputies and successors. Four generations after Cain's birth we find Enoch's great-great-grandson Lamech still exercising, in fact augmenting, the prerogative of divine vengeance. And therefore we go to Genesis 4, verse 23 and 24. Quote, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly, Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. Unquote. Receiving authority to govern requires taking an oath which binds the initiate to a code of rights and responsibilities. Now, I hope you got that very well. Receiving authority to govern requires taking an oath which binds the initiate to a code of rights and responsibilities. Now, what does God say of taking an oath? 
before we go any further, we have to know what does the Bible say about taking an oath. When I read to you Matthew 5 and verse 33 and following, this is Jesus speaking. Quote, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is its footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Unquote. That's what Jesus says about swearing. So it should be clear to everybody, not later than now, that swearing any oath is against the word of God. So, when we come to this conclusion, that swearing any oath is the word against, of wor uh, the, against the word of God, how then can a government sworn for of the people, by the people and for the people, be a godly government? It cannot. And by their fruits you will know them and see that they are not for serving the people, but serving themselves and their master, who is the enemy of Christ, Satan. Do you get it? Do you understand what I just told you? I hope so, otherwise listen to it again. Receiving authority to govern requires taking an oath which binds the initiate to a code of rights and responsibilities. Interesting, our word oath is the cognate with the Hebrew word, which is written here, I can't read, but which is also pronounced oath, which is the word translated mark at Genesis 4 verse 15, quote, The Lord set a mark upon Cain, unquote. Yeah. And what do we read in Revelation 13 about a mark, which is an oath? Do we now understand that Sunday law is the mark of the Roman Catholic Church, is the mark of Cain, is the mark of Satan he wants to give to the world? Because when you have the mark of Cain, when you have the mark of the Antichrist on your forehead or on your right hand, meaning by what you think or what you are doing, then you are worshipping Satan. You are doing exactly that, what Satan asked of Jesus three times in the times when Jesus went out 40 days in the desert and was tempted by the devil. All these things I will give you if you just fall down and worship me. Jesus wouldn't do it. Will you? Will you? The Lord set a mark upon Cain, and that mark is worship, Sunday worship. The author continues, knowing this, we may accurately say, quote, the Lord put Cain under oath, unquote. An oath visibly represented by the various insignia governments display. The mark, then, stands for a covenant between God and Cain. It is not the all-encompassing sort of covenant which God struck with the humbly obedient Abraham, as we can read in Genesis 7, verse 7 and 8, quote, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and unto the seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Unquote. Cain's unwillingness to obey the letter of Yahweh's commandments made him unfit for intimacy with the divine. 
In Cain's own words, quote, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. The exile covenant was strictly limited to assuring God's vengeance against anyone who would threaten Cain's life. In matters of wisdom, correction, instruction and righteousness, Cain was on his own. He was on his own also if he, could, if he should try to attack the peaceful. The mark was a covenant of retrib retribution only. Early on, Cain saw there was great profit in provoking a silence. The more enemies, the more spectacular the displays of vengeance. The more vengeance, the more justice. The more justice, the more power to Cain. A more powerful Cain could do more excellent public works. This is a very profound sentence that I'm going to read again. The more enemies, the more spectacular the displays of vengeance. The more vengeance, the more justice. The more justice, the more power to Cain. A more powerful Cain could do more excellent public works. Hmm. To me, this is a perfect description of the papacy, the bearer of the mark of Cain, in his own words. Remember the beginning of this chapter? Quote, the mark of Cain is stamped upon our foreheads. Across the centuries our brother Abel has lain in blood which he we drew and shed tears we caused by forgetting thy love. Unquote. The Antichrist is telling you in his own words who he really is. Time to understand for the people listening to see and hear what is really going on. After 24 chapters, it's about time you get it. Thus, the author continues on the bottom of page 274. It became essential to the self-interest of the bearer of the mark, which remains to this day a first principle of ordered government, to provoke and encourage evil-doing, particularly the form that manifests itself in rebellion. Cain terrorized evil with awesome dependability. His faith had, uh, that God would avenge his enemies made him a highly reliable public protector. Down through the ages, righteous people could live secure in the knowledge that the mark bearer would stop at nothing to persecute evildoers. This fact is marvelously declared in Scripture. In the 7th century BC, the mark-bearing Babylonians were appointed by God to capture the wayward Israelites and show them some harsh discipline. Israel couldn't understand why God would put a vain, evil Babylonian king over his own chosen people. God explained, saying, quote, See, he is puffed up, and his desires are not upright, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Or, as we can read in the King James Version of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Unquote. How has the mark managed to remain vibrant for nearly 6,000 years? Grand Commander Albert Pike Grand Commander Albert Pike. I don't think that I need to explain to you who Albert Pike was, right? So I just go over it here and leave it with this. In his influential works, work, Morals and Dogma, threw valuable light on the subject. He declared that, quote-unquote, from the earliest time, Freemasonry has been the custodian and depository of, quote, the symbols, emblems and allegories erected by Enoch, unquote. as we can read in Morals and Dogma, page 210. The commander was careful to say he meant not Cain's son Enoch, but the Bible's other Enoch, Enoch II, the good Enoch, the Enoch, quote, who walked with God, unquote. However, his attempt to disassociate his institution from Cain 
puts the commander at variance with Masonic and Biblical chronologically. chronology. For if a Biblical Enoch erected the earliest imagery of Freemasonry, it could not possibly have been Enoch II. It, have, it had to have been Enoch I. Now, let's examine the chronology. Now it gets really interesting. Enoch II was descended from Seth, whom Eve conceived after the death of Abel. Quote, For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And read Genesis 4, verse 25. Quote, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Unquote. When Eve conceived Seth, Adam was a hundred and thirty years old, as we can read for confirmation in the Bible. This is no conjecture, this is all biblically proven. Genesis 5, verse 3, quote, And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. Tupper's footnote is pointing to Genesis 5, verse 4, so I corrected this in this reading with Genesis 5, verse 3, so when you go through the book and you look at the footnote, it's 5, verse 3, and not 5, verse 4. There was a little mistake in there. Now, when Eve conceived Seth, Adam was 130 years old. Alright? So when you are with me that far, fine. Now, listen. According to the scripturally faithful computations of the Archbishop of Armagh, James Usher, who lived between 1581 and 1656, Adam was created in 4004 before Christ. Thus, Seth was born 3,874 uh, before Christ. Genesis 5, chapter 6 through 20 give us an exact toll of the years between Seth and his great-great-great-great-grandson Enoch II. Therefore I will put in the video now this little table that you see with the father, the son and the age of the father at son's birth. Seth was 105 when he bore Enos. Enos was 90 when Canaan was born, Canaan 70 when Mahalil was born, Malahil 65 when Jared was born, and Jared 162 when Enoch II was born. That rounds up to 492 years. 492 years. According to the Bible, Enoch II was born 492 years after the birth of Seth, or in 3382 BC. Now, Commander Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, reckons its date of publication in both Christian, 1871 AD, and Masonic, 5680 AM chronology. AM stands for Anno Mundi. To find out the beginning of Masonic history, that quote-unquote earliest time in which Enoch erected his quote symbols, emblems and allegories unquote, in terms of Christian chronology, we subtract the given Christian year from its Masonic equivalent, meaning 1871 from 5680. This gives us a first Masonic year of 3809 BC. Now, going a little bit into the footnote, there is a discrepancy of 191 years between Pike's reckoning and that inscribed into the plaque of the Capitol Cornerstone, 1793 AD from 5793 AM. I am inclined to believe Pike's is more scientifically determined than that. The author adds here. But the figures show that Enoch II was not born until 3382, some 427 years after Freemasonry's quote-unquote earliest time. Enoch II could not possibly have erected the prototypical symbol, symbolic devices of which Freemasonry has ever been custodian and depository. However, Cain's son, Enoch I, very well could have. Cain began his wandering after Abel's death, all right? 
which the Bible marks with Seth's conception and Adam's age, 130 years, and about 3876 BC. If we give Cain 10 years to find a wife, settle down and sire a child, Enoch the first would have been born in 3866 BC. This, was well, this would make him a 55-year-old man in the first Masonic year, 3809. At that age, Enoch I would have been fully equipped to erect symbols and allegories memorializing his father's divine appointment to rule populations, quote, out from the presence of the Lord, unquote. As we can read in Genesis 4, verse 16, quote, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt on the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. In my humble opinion, there's a little thinking mistake of the author here, and uh, you can all discuss me on that and say maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. The author says, Cain began his wandering after Abel's death, which the Bible marks with Seth's conception and Adam's age 130 years, in about 3876 BC. If we give Cain 10 years to find a wife, settle down and sire a child, Enoch I would have been born at 3866. Now, where is the thinking fault that Tapasosi makes here in this point? There is no doubt that Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born. But he says, now give te Cain ten years to find a wife. Where does his wife come from at that time? It is not recorded that after the birth of Cain and Abel, Eve bore daughters. And there had to be daughters for Cain to find a wife. They don't fall out of heaven, you know. They have to be born. Adam and Eve were the first people in the world, and they were to multiply and fill the world. So... I think that there's maybe some things that we should <laughs> reflect about at a quiet time. That maybe it is not that easy when you just jiggle the numbers. I'm always against just taking the numbers and making things up if it is not written in the Bible. Cain had to find a wife. And of course, later on in the Bible it is written... That Cain found a wife, you know. Because in Genesis 6 we read, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now we are speaking of the sons of God, meaning the God believing the righteous people, not the ones with the mark of Cain, saw the daughters of Min, saw the daughters of what came out of the seed of Cain, that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they choose. So there were daughters, yeah, but where were these daughters in the beginning of the world? God created Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had as a child, as a child Cain and Abel. And, of course, later on, other daughters and other sons, starting with Seth, when Adam was 130 years old. I don't deny that. But where, when Tapa Saucy gives him, uh, what was it, a 55-year-old man, uh, make, gives, him 40, uh, gives him 55 years to find, uh, gives him 10, wife, 10 years to find a wife, settle down and sire a child, um, well, that must have been born first. Uh, we don't know that, so this is more supposition than, or, than actually knowledge that the writer writes here. So I tell you just to be a little bit careful about this. But the author continues at the bottom of page 276. Incidentally, Professor Saisi placed, in, uh, placed Cain in Masonry's early years against his previous determinations. Saisi admitted to being compelled by the scholarly diligence of a latter-day Babylonian king to accept the evidence that Sargon lived as early as 4,000 years before Christ. Quote, the last king of Babylonia, Nabonidas, had antiquarian tastes and busied himself not only with the restoration of the old temples of his country, 
but also with the disinterment of the memorial cylinders which the builders and the restorers had buried beneath their foundation. It was known that the great temple of the sun god at Sippara had originally been erected by Naram Sin, which is another name for Enoch, the son of Sargon, which is another name for Cain, and attempts had been already made to find the records which, it was assumed, he had entombed other, uh, under his angles. With true antiquarian zeal, Nabonidas continued the search until he had lighted upon, quote, the foundation stone, unquote, of Naram Sin himself. This, quote, unquote, foundation stone, he tells us, had been seen by none of his predecessors for 3,200 years. In the opinion, accordingly, of Nabonidas, a king who was curious about the past history of his country, and whose royal position gave him the best possible opportunities for learning all that could be known about it, Naram Sin and his father Sargon lived 3,200 years before his own time, or 3,750 BC. Unquote. What we see in the Bible's account of how Unuk came about is nothing less than the foundation of the world's legal system. That God would ordain an evil man to administer the law makes sublime sense to me. Well, to me too. And what else is the Pope then than an evil man? who is ordained, saved by the mark of Cain, protected by the mark of Cain, an evil man to rule the world, the Antichrist, right? All roads lead to Rome. Now in our final chapter I shall ask your indulgence in a few personal reflections of my own as to how a system designed to process evil can do as much good as it does. Interesting point Tava brings up here. And that will lead us to chapter 25, which is called The Two Ministries, which is for another day. I think you still have to maybe listen to this one once again to get it all. I read it a few times, <laughs> and still here and there questions pop up. But I liked it. I hope you like it too, and I also like to have here and there a little feedback in the form of a comment. If you finally get it, please. Thank you. So thanks for listening. Until next time, God bless you all. This is Jörg from YouTube channel Jockler66 signing off. Rulers of Evil, Chapter 24, The Mark of Cain. Until next time, God bless you all and bye bye.